Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're going to give everyone a few minutes to join the meeting before we get started. I'm Melissa Meyer. I'm a communications manager at the RTA. We're really excited to have everyone here. Um, please go ahead and join, stay muted, open the chat. We'll get started in just a minute. We have uh, Jessica Cabe from our communication staff um, going to be working the chat today. So once you settle in, feel free to introduce yourself and uh, rename yourself if you need to and let us know if you're having any technical issues. But we will give everyone a, another minute or two to join before we get started. Welcome to people who are just joining. Uh, feel free to keep your camera on and your microphone muted for now, and we will get started in just a minute. Uh, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat. And we'll get started here and give people just maybe two more minutes. I see a lot of people still joining. All right, good morning to everybody who's just joining. As I said, feel free to rename yourself if you need to, introduce yourself in the chat. Jessica Cabe from our staff will be uh, in the chat, uh, sharing links and uh, answering any questions if you have them during the meeting. And we'll also be having discussion uh, and polls and, as well. Give everyone just one more minute to join. Looks like we have a good group here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started, but uh, continue to join, rename yourself, introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, we're so glad to have everyone here. As I mentioned, Jessica Cave is going to be in the chat um, sharing links. Uh, you may see a link to a blog post that we wrote on the topic that we are going to discuss today, which is paying for and expanding our reduced fare and ride-free programs. We sent it out before the meeting, but it might be helpful to reference in the discussion today. Uh, there's also a membership survey um, for anyone who's you know, joining the, our coalition here to just tell us more about yourself and what you're interested in. Um, we sent that out before the meeting as well. So feel free to fill that out. Let us know how you want to be engaged in this process, what topics you're interested in advancing. Again, if you want to rename yourself, go ahead and do that now. And as I said, welcome to the, the first meeting of the Transit is the Answer Coalition. My name is Melissa. I'm the communications manager here at the RTA. And we are so glad that so many of you are joining us this morning. Uh, just to kind of orient everyone to a few things, uh, we have a big group joining us and we're so excited to see so many passionate transit supporters. Um, but we do wanna you know, keep this meeting short and get to the discussion. So we are planning to have a short presentation in the beginning and then really spend the majority of the time having discussion. We'll have some polls, we'll have time for you to talk in the chat, time to come off mute and give us your thoughts and also ways for you to engage after the meeting um, via a survey or continuing to give us feedback. This meeting will last about an hour and then you'll be free to go or if you'd like to stay, um, we'll keep the Zoom open for another half an hour until 11 for Q&A, networking, and any kind of other announcements that anyone wants to share or uh, any kind of you know ongoing conversation that people aren't ready to to end right at 10.30, but I think uh, I'll do a quick intro of the other uh, staff members who are gonna be speaking today. We have uh, Peter Kirsten, who's gonna talk about our new strategic plan and give an update on implementation. And Kyle Whitehead will lead the presentation on paying for and expanding the reduced fare and ride free program. 
and I'll be back to help with the, the discussion. So, as I said, please uh, stay on mute, raise your hand if you have questions. Um, there's a closed caption button to turn on if you'd like to see a written transcript. And um, thank you everyone for being here. Peter, if you want to share the slides. Go ahead to the next slide. So, as I said, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the first meeting of the Transit is the Answer Coalition. Uh, some of you may have been engaged with the RTA in this effort from the very beginning when we started developing our strategic plan a few years ago. And for some of you, this may be your first time joining us. And either way, we are so glad you're here. If you aren't familiar, the RTA is the Regional Transportation Authority. And we don't operate the buses and trains, but we oversee financing and planning for CTA, Metro, and PACE. And the RTA is required to create a strategic plan for our transit system every five years. But we've never taken such a collaborative approach during plan development, and we've never continued that collaboration after a plan was adopted, like we are doing with this coalition. So this is all new for us, too, and we're really excited about it. So why are we here? I think we all know that transit has been challenged like never before in the past few years, and we're still facing difficult times ahead. An operating funding gap is looming when COVID relief dollars run out. Concerns about safety, equity, and climate change are at the top of our minds. And an ongoing operator shortage has led to concerns about frequency and reliability. But this is also a time of great opportunity for transit. We truly believe that transit is the answer to some of the biggest issues that the Chicago region is facing. But to achieve that true potential will take work and investment. What we've learned over the last few years is that we're not alone and we cannot solve these issues alone. So many people that we've met are so passionate about not just preserving Chicago's transit system, but making it better. And we have a better chance of being successful when we all work together. So if you haven't read everything in Transit is the Answer, our plan adopted in February, that's okay. Uh, there's more information about it online and we'll go over a few basics, but what we really wanna do with this meeting is dive into the messy work of implementation. The strategic plan, we see it as a blueprint uh, with some goals of where we want to go in the next few years, but these meetings are how we're gonna get there. Next slide. So just a little bit about what to expect from this coalition. First, we're planning to meet quarterly with these virtual meetings. Our hope is that each meeting tackles a specific project from the plan that we're working on implementing, and we want to hear from all of you about how you think we should do it, what to prioritize, and if we're heading in the right or wrong direction. We plan to hold these meetings in advance of our board of directors meetings so that we can take your input to our governing body and have a real impact on the decisions that they're making. What does it mean to be a member of our coalition? It could mean a variety of things over the next few years. Right now, we're just asking you to attend meetings, speak up, tell your friends. There will also be opportunities to get involved in projects that you're passionate about, such as joining a steering committee or asking you to sign a petition or advocate for us along with us on specific topics related to transit. Mostly, we hope that you'll stay engaged, advocate for transit funding and for transit in general, um, and help keep pushing the RTA and the transit agencies forward. We need all of you. There is a membership survey, like I mentioned, that we sent out that has a couple quick questions about what topics you're most interested in helping us advance. Uh, we'll use that to learn more about the members of our coalition and draw from that to you know, put together maybe smaller teams that are interested in specific topics like climate, safety, things like that. So as I mentioned, this type of coalition is not something that the RTA has done before, but Transit is the Answer outlined three principles committed to change, equity, and stewardship, which you can read more about online. Um, we'll put a, a link in the chat, but this coalition is just one way of several that you'll see us trying to live out those principles over the next few years. We've been doing innovative and collaborative engagement uh, during plan development for the last few years, and our big priorities have been to focus on transparency and accountability, meaning we want to share how we make decisions and hear your feedback and then loop back to you to show how your input is making a difference. 
So in that spirit, I think we'll also share a couple general codes of conduct that we've used, you know, during our engagement, some ground rules that just ensure that everyone is coming into these conversations with good intent and productive spirit, remembering that we're all working toward a transit system that works better for everyone. And we all have that goal. And that starts today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Peter Kirsten to give a brief overview of the projects that we're working on. And then we're gonna dive deeper into one of them, um, which is a desire to make transit more affordable by expanding the free and reduced fare offerings that we already have to other populations, such as people experiencing low incomes. We wanna have a conversation about what we should prioritize in creating a program like that and how we can ensure that it does the most good. Uh, as I said, this meeting will last about an hour, but everyone is welcome to stay an additional 30 minutes for Q&A with RTA staff, networking, continuing the conversation, um, and we'll continue to get feedback from you throughout the meeting, after the meeting, and on to our next uh, coalition meeting. We'll you know, give updates on the projects that we've started along the way. So thank you so much again for joining, and Peter, next slide. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, so my name is Peter Kirsten. I'm a program manager uh, working uh, exclusively on strategic plan implementation. Uh, I'm really excited by how many people are here um, and uh, the, the, to get this work started. Um, so on the screen, uh, you're seeing a page from the plan, uh, Actions for Success. Uh, the plan articulates these, the set of actions that we're all committing to undertake in 2023. So the actions are shown here on the slide and are divided between funding uh, initiatives to improve rider experience and then investments that support the thriving region. Um, so uh, as, as for the update, uh, we're gonna kind of tackle these one by one and share uh, the individual projects under each. So in 2023, we commit to take affirmative steps forward to secure increased funding for transit operations. We commit to deliver a set of new regional transit initiatives that will make the system better for riders. And we commit to collaboratively begin development of three regional action plans to program investments that support a thriving region. So first funding, um, again, uh, you know, we're, we're committing to taking these affirmative steps. Internally, we're scoping these as three separate projects. Um, all of these have kicked off uh, you're seeing on the screen here, uh, each individual project. Uh, the first is a public affairs and outreach campaign on transit funding to continue to educate the region on what's at stake, as well as demonstrating the value the transit system brings to our region. Uh, the second project under the funding category is to coordinate the stakeholders on funding proposals to the Illinois General Assembly. Uh, thus far, the primary venue for this has been um, participating in the plan of action for regional transit project that CMAP or the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning is leading. Um, this, this project will also be a key element in articulating financial performance to the RTA board and to the public. And then the third project um, is to develop permanent funding structural reform. Uh, so this means continuing to advocate uh, at regional, state, and federal levels for sustainable funding operations, op operations funding. Um, this also means extending the temporary recovery ratio relief that has been in place during the pandemic um, while advocating to permanently remove recovery ratio as a statutory requirement to transit funding in our region. So again, the second bucket of actions for success, we're committing to deliver a set of regional transit initiatives that will make the system better for riders. And then kind of same format here. So it's three separate projects and I'll walk through each one. Um, first is securing funding to be able to expand the existing free and reduced fare program to include income as a component for eligibility, um, making the system more affordable and to advance our understanding of how fares uh, present a barrier to accessing transit for some. Uh, this project has already begun, and the second half of our meeting today will focus on this project. The second project is a safety and security summit to advance holistic solutions to the root causes of safety and security issues that are impacting transit. So we're aiming to hold the event over the summer, uh, but that will be dependent upon coordination with other stakeholders. Uh, so many different elements of government, social service, advocacy, 
have a stake in ensuring that we guarantee a safe and secure system for all riders, it is critical that we leverage stakeholders in facilitating a discussion around holistic solutions to the challenges affecting transit. And then the third project is a review of rider communication and information sharing. Uh, this project will kick off later this year. Um, and current activities include coordination with the service boards through two existing groups uh, that, that cover uh, stations and signage and then real-time data coordination. Again, then the third category uh, of actions for success is to collaboratively begin development of three regional action plans to program investments that support a thriving region. And then similar format here, uh, three separate projects. Uh, so the first is a regional accessibility improvement plan. The idea here is to advance at regional scale, a plan to achieve a fully accessible transit system. So CTA has um, the All Stations Accessibility Program, or ASAP, uh, which has become a national model for accessibility improvement planning. And our intention here is to build on that with Metra and PACE in seeking funding to realize a fully accessible system. Uh, the second is a climate action plan um, that similarly advances work on zero emissions transit planning that's already been happening uh, at the service boards, um, but at regional scale while also ensuring that we're fully leveraging transit as a tool to achieve other broader regional goals around climate. Uh, while it is critical that we continue to decrease the climate impacts that transit creates, um, we know that the biggest impact transit can have for the region is achieved through more people riding buses and trains and less people driving private automobiles. Um, the third project is an update uh, to the setting the stage for transit report to help communities uh, that host transit services uh, plan for equitable and efficient land use around stations and stops. Um, all three of these projects will begin this summer or later into the year. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pause for a moment uh, to see if there are questions. Um, again, these are kind of the, uh, the projects under these actions for success around funding, rider initiatives, um, and then uh, action plans. Um, this is gonna be kind of the primary focus to start here um, in terms of implementing the plan. Um, I see there's a question from Adam. This is Adam Kerman. Um, I'm on the uh, advisory board for uh, PACE and RTA. Um, I, wish to express my concern for making a priority uh, the expansion of uh, free fares and reduced fares based on income of the uh, uh, based on income of the passenger. Um, the most important purpose of public transportation is to improve the lives of people who would use public transportation because it serves, the uh, it serves the travel need it serves the local travel needs of the people that would use public transportation. Free fares or reduced fares do not accomplish that. For instance, if there if we see an expanding corridor for jobs in the area southwest of Joliet, or in the Schaumburg Hoffman Estates area, it really doesn't make any difference to the passenger. If you offer free and reduced fares on Metra or the buses, if the final transportation destination is not reachable by public transportation. It's also a matter of uh, public transportation has to operate during the hours and the times that the passenger needs it. And it also, and um, for families with young children, it has to be available. Uh, so that uh, one of the parents might be might have to drop the children off at daycare. Free fares or reduced fares does not achieve any of this. In fact, I would argue that it's not it's not, it's it's an unimportant barrier. It's probably not a barrier at all. The best way public transportation can improve the lives of the people it serves is by offering a better quality product to the traveling public that meets 
today's travel demands. And that is what I believe RTA should prioritize. If, if we get stuck with free fares and reduced fares, that's just more fodder for the people who don't want to give any more public resources to public transportation. I would urge RTA to reconsider this. And thanks for sharing. I think those are the kind of conversations that we want to get into. I'll just say of all the projects that Peter just described, I would say none of them are happening in a vacuum. So there'll be work to look at accessibility and reliability and frequency at the same time as work to look at affordability. Um, a lot of different topics to address, I think. Um, I saw a question and we're going to get more into that conversation in just a little bit. I'm going to get a couple questions in the chat and then uh, my colleague Kyle is going to give a overview of kind of where we are right now with the free and reduced fare issue and then we'll, we'll kind of let everybody talk a bit more but um, Audrey had a question in the chat about RTA's plans regarding equitable land use. Um, I don't know Peter if you want to talk about one of the projects related to ETOD. Sure um, so the last project on the list here is this updating the setting the stage for transit which is an existing um, RTA document, uh, but it's it's out of date, it's old. Um, but it's, uh, the idea here is to um, be kind of a toolkit for communities that host transit services to help them plan um, both the land use and the infrastructure that supports uh, transit stations and stops um, in their communities. Um, so I think there's you know a lot of momentum with uh, TOD and ETOD in our region. And our, our hope is to kind of capture some of that um, in updating this work. Um, I think there's also, uh, you know, opportunities there to address some of the ways that um, needs are changing in the region. Uh, you know, the, the nine to five downtown work commute um, is not what it used to be. Uh, we maybe um, need to think about kind of the value proposition for transit, um, particularly in suburban areas um, that oftentimes thought of transit as job access to the loop. Um, but now may see the station area um, as uh, offering more than just kind of one way travel. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, Audrey, if, you, if you'd like to get involved with that project, I think there will be opportunities as well um, to help influence that work. I'll just read a couple of comments from the chat and then we'll see if there's other questions before we move on. Uh, someone said that fares are absolutely a barrier from personal experience. Someone else said, um, offer what they need when they need it, um, that we need to think about frequency and fares. Um, there's a question about if the plan will specifically address challenges that surface from mega projects um, in Chicago, such as the 78, Lincoln Yards, the casino. I don't know if anyone wants to, to address that. I think we make these plans every five years. So the, there's a, a look at kind of big projects that are happening in the region. And we work closely with um, our partners at CMAP who also put out a regional plan every couple of years and look at major projects in the whole region. So those are considerations, but I don't know if there's anything specific you wanna mention, Peter. Um, I, I'd say, um... Just from the get-go, the, the focus of this plan is more on the operation side than the capital side. Um, while we're obviously coordinating uh, on capital projects, um, the the looming cliff, uh, the kind of the where the where the stakes are the highest right now in the transit world is is on securing ongoing sustainable operations funding. Um, and the primary 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 focus of our implementation is going to be on that, um, at least in the first uh, year or two years here. Um, I do see, Melissa, there's also two hands up. Uh, John Plant, if you want to come off mute and make a comment. Are we? John, you're, you're yeah, still you're... muted, John, if, if you needed to comment, or we can maybe jump to Ryan and come back to John. Sure, Ryan, if you want to go ahead. Ryan, there you go. Yes, uh, this is Ryan Simwelski with uh, the Harvey Historical Society. Uh, I, I just wanted to chime in. I think it was Adam who had made the comment. He does uh, make a very good point. And you talk about the looming, uh, looming uh, cliff, which is also an important uh, thing to consider. Um, personally, I like the idea of the um, 
the South Cook um, uh, fair transit program. And um, obviously I'm in Harvey the Metro Electric. So I do, I think we, we need to look at data um, to see, for instance, has ridership gone up on the Metro Electric on the Rock Island, you know, with giving those the reduced fares. Um, I do think you have to be careful, especially with this booming financial crisis. Um, we want to help everyone, ideally. Ideally, transit should be, I think, free for everyone, you know, to go everywhere. But I do think Adam raised some good points about, um, I mean, it just has to be done so carefully. So I think doing things like partnering with the county where the RTA is not having to, um, you know, to, to sort of use its typical funds to, to subsidize, you know, and, and able to do that would be, would be um, more prudent. Uh, what you don't want to do is uh, is just sort of pandering to folks like um, uh, former Governor Bogoyevich did. I don't know if you guys remember some years ago, but he had, I think he just made uh, like all tra transit free for all seniors or something, but whatever it was, you know, it was it was lovely. And, and it's something like we, we all want free transit for everyone, but it was just financially totally unfeasible. And so I think that's the danger is um, we just have to be careful that, you know, we're not uh, affecting the bottom line so that we're actually able to have service. And when people talk about expanding service, uh, either to, you know, new lines or um, more frequent service, all of that does take money. So personally, I, I like the idea of um, picking areas like you guys did with the fair, uh, the South Cook fair transit thing, um, you know, air, areas instead of people. Um, I also think it would save, uh, save you guys money, you know, when you're, trying to remain solvent. So in other words, instead, instead of saying system-wide, we want you know, to uh, lower the cost for everyone, um, picking those areas that are truly, truly in need, like, like the Metro Electric uh, areas you know, that that's, that's served, or maybe um, yeah, Austin, Englewood, I don't know, whatever, whatever areas that you, know, you, you see that people truly, truly need more access to transit. Um, but definitely, I would say on the South side, because obviously we have we have a lot of transit sort of deserts and um, just very, very, very long commutes. So just wanted to echo that and say where I do agree with Adam though, is that you, you can't be too generous with, with uh, granting these reduced fares and everything because um, uh, for instance, here on the South side, even if we, like we have half price Metra, but the problem is, is that it still just takes a really long time to get downtown. So yep. uh, Ryan, that's I'm the other thing. I'm gonna cut you off just so we have time for a, a couple others. You're hammering on a couple important things here though. Um, Geography-based system, uh, that, that's, a, that's a concept we'll get to in a moment here. So um, tying the, the program to a specific community that you think can benefit most from it, as well as ensuring that we're securing funding to do this. That's gonna be a theme of the next element. So I really appreciate the comments, um, kind of a great lead in. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more. David, I see you've been, um, waiting patiently, go ahead and come off mute and, and ask your question. Hey everybody, I'm David Poe with the Active Transportation Alliance. Uh, I just wanted to uh, echo all the comments I've heard from RTA over the last few months about how important it is to reduce the barriers to entry uh, for transit. Uh, what we've seen with the Fair Transit South Cook pilot uh, is that the barriers to entry uh, have been lowered for hundreds of thousands of people uh, in uh, South Chicago and the South suburbs. Um, Obviously, comparing Hoffman Estates and Schomburg, where I used to work, to the south side of Chicago uh, isn't particularly useful when we're trying to come up with solutions to uh, accessing transit, household income in the west suburbs, very different from the south side of Chicago. So I think what we've seen RTA, Cook County, uh, Pace, Metra, uh, and uh, unfortunately, not the city of Chicago uh, do to improve access in the South side to this project has been fantastic. Um, many advocacy organizations are pushing uh, the mayor elect uh, to have the city participate in the Fair Transit South Cook pilot. And we look forward to RTA's continued leadership on reducing barriers to transit for the folks who need it most. So thank you, thank you for prioritizing this important aspect of the planning process. Appreciate the comments. Uh, David. Um, Kyle, I see you have your hand oh. up if you want to come oh. off mute. Hey there, thank you so much. I just wanted to speak, you know, just on behalf of the, uh, someone who is a poor working class Chicagoan, that fares are absolutely a barrier to transit. I can speak to many times where I personally have had difficulty being able to get on the bus to go to work. 
Um, but I'm also someone who is not historically qualified to receive free fares or reduced fares. So it, it, it absolutely is a barrier. Um, you know, something that I would encourage you to consider is looking at fare capping. Um, there are many times where I've purchased day passes because I can't front the $75 up front for a month. And that may be an extended period where I do that. And so I end up paying way more um, because I can't pay up front in the short term. Um, so introducing fare capping would be a really big um, help for folks like me where, you know, you're spending you're spending the money on the transit system. And then, you know, once you've reached that $75, now you have you can ride free for the remainder of that period. And I think that that would be really, really helpful for a lot of folks in situations like me. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective, Kyle. Um, we are uh, getting close on time here to move to the next section. I uh, really, really appreciate all the comments um, and thoughtful input we've gotten so far. Um, John Plant, I know you were, I have been waiting a while. Are you able to come off mute and uh, ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, I am off mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, I just wanted to push back a little on, on these reservations about uh, the, the fare issues. Uh, number one, uh, we already have reduced fares all over the place. Uh, and what, and I'm not, I'm not accusing um, uh, either of the commenters, uh, certainly uh, about this, but you know, the argument uh, that they're worried about smacks of elitism uh, doesn't really uh, uh, present uh, anything that's relevant to the region. And number two, um, the, uh, in trying to link the, the fair issue with uh, first mile, last mile is, is erroneous. Um, first mile, last mile is an issue separate and apart from the fares. Uh, and it's been solved in some places. Uh, the CTA did it with the uh, UPS by creating a special route that you, UPS will pay for. Uh, Metra is in its association with the Lake County Partners has uh, uh, been able to uh, establish um, uh, a service between certain uh, employers and uh, the Metra stations. Uh, for the first mile, last mile. I mean, there are ways around this, that, that, but they're not connected to the, the fair issue at all. Um, and finally, yes, I know there'll be pushback. I expect pushback. I also expect pushback because you're going to have the same kind of people saying, well, you got, you know, every, every uh, agency has its own planning staff. Why didn't you just have one, one planning staff? I mean, all of these are things that we have to tackle. We have to be able to explain to uh, uh, legislators and, and the public that you know it isn't one size fits all that we need to do what we need to do is what we need to do and how we need to do it so you know i just uh i i, I think we should you know not be weak uh hearted or you know faint hearted about uh, going ahead and looking and exploring fair packages that's it appreciate the comment john and um just for, for the group, I will say that we're going to provide a lot more information on uh, many of the things people have brought up here in the second half of the program. So we have time for two more quick ones. I can see John Brophy, you've had your hand up for a while. If you want to come off mute to make a quick comment or question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm calling in today as a, a former uh, sustainability director of City Colleges of Chicago. I, I've now moved to Davenport, Iowa, so I'm no longer a local stakeholder. Uh, but the issue I wanted to raise is that the CTA, uh, Chicago Transit Authority, provides a U-Pass for college students um, that we've had for about 15 years now. And uh, we've expanded it to part-time students uh, because at City Colleges, the majority of our students are actually part-timers. And we found that that's been a great uh, relationship with the CTA because they get off-peak ridership. They get ridership at night. Uh, it makes the trains safer. Uh, and the students get to classes on time, they get to internships, jobs, get to grandmother's house on time, pick up their kids, uh, take care of a variety of internships and wh whatever jobs they have to get to anywhere in the city. The Metra has taken the exact opposite strategy 
even though in the authorizing statute language, it uh, says that a student fee must be offered, uh, they define college students as not students. Uh, and so they haven't offered a discount to college students. And it's, uh, it's been reflected in their ridership. So college students look to the advisors uh, for what their transportation options are. We've been able to offer a Divi membership as part of their student fees. So now they have Divi and they have CTA and Metra continues to litigate the issue, essentially hiring lobbyists to avoid having to offer a student discount. And I think it's a complete mistake and it shows students your priorities. You, you, you don't sell to people you don't want to ride on your trains. So if you wanted to ride on your trains, sell to them, advertise to them, and, and create a uh, pass that works for a semester, which is the length of time they're in school. Uh, to, to pretend that they're gonna be able to navigate a system without some sort of attention, I, I think is disingenuous. And uh, during, during COVID, the, the ridership just collapsed completely. So now we have to be uh, cognizant that you, you have to attract people uh, intentionally and it's no longer uh, time to play games about do we have to offer it, do we not have to offer it? You have to, and you have to do it intentionally and you have to be specific about college students. So thanks for your time. Thank appreciate you so the, much. Yep, appreciate the comment. Um, we are at time, we need to move to the next section. Fabio, um, if possible, please stay uh, for um, the discussion at the end and, and we'll get to your comment at that time. Or if it's related to um, the specific project today, um, there will be opportunities to speak further. You muted yourself there, Peter. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> there will be more time for Q&A afterwards. Um, we're, we're going to move to the next section uh, of the presentation, though, um, and I will turn it over to my uh, colleague, Kyle. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, really useful feedback and questions in the chat um, and for people who are coming on camera. So um, feel free to keep your hands up if you have additional little comments or questions on free or reduced fares. We'll have a Q&A portion on this topic right after um, my presentation. And if you have questions on additional topics, uh, feel free to hang out for the, the bonus half hour after the meeting, or we will share an email address where you can follow up with us directly. Um, so I, I'm Kyle Whitehead working on government affairs and policy here at RTA. It's good to see um, a lot of familiar faces in the, in the virtual room here. Now that you've heard an update and overview of the plan, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive on a project to fund and expand free and reduced fare programs. We're eager to hear your input and feedback as this project is still in development. If you don't get a chance to share feedback during the meeting, there'll be a follow-up survey via email, or you can always follow up with me or any of the other staff members directly. Um, if this is not your topic of choice and you wanna make sure we do a deep dive on a different uh, topic at a future meeting, uh, again, there'll be opportunities to suggest topics. Um, we will continue this structure uh, in upcoming meetings over the next several months. Next slide, PK. This is a reminder of the commitment RTA made in the plan. Uh, we are seeking funding for an expanded regional free or reduced fare program that's available to people experiencing low incomes. Clearly there's lots of different ways this program could be structured and there are trade-offs for each option. Uh, and we're gonna get into some of those trade-offs in today's discussion. This goal is closely linked to the number one goal in the plan which is to secure increased funding for transit operations. Appreciate that everybody was linking these two issues in, in their comments and questions that we should, we need to make sure that there's funding to support um, the overall transit system and any new programs uh, that are added. As many of you know, without new public funding, the system is facing a $730 million operating shortfall starting in 2026 when federal relief funds run out. The RTA, CTA, Metra, and PACE are advocating for leaders at every level of government to help us close that gap and develop a funding structure that's less reliant on rider fares. If we have new public funding and structural reform, we'll have more flexibility to advance equity through initiatives like expanded free and reduced fare programs. Next slide. First, some backgrounds on the read region's existing program for people with disabilities, seniors, and students. These are all critical programs that connect many of the most vulnerable people in our region to jobs, healthcare, and other opportunities. 
They give people with limited transportation options independence and the freedom to move. RTA and the service boards are fully committed to sustaining them now and into the future. First, we have paratransit service. This is door-to-door -door service for people with disabilities who live in areas served by the fixed route system, but aren't physically able to use it. PACE is the second largest paratransit operator in the, U in the US behind New York. RTA certifies el eligibility for the paratransit program. Next, free or reduced fares. The RTA also certifies eligibility for this program, which allows seniors and people with disabilities to ride CTA, Metra, and PACE at little to no cost to the rider. Income verification is done in partnership with the Department of Aging. Finally, each of the operators also offer discounted fares to students riding transit on school days. Next slide. The problem is these vital programs are drastically underfunded. Paratransit is a federally mandated program, but it hasn't been appropriately funded since it was established in the ADA in 1990. This year, the state appropriation for paratransit service is projected to cover less than 4% of the overall cost of the program. This means local agencies are left to cover the bulk of the cost ourselves out of general operating revenue. This is funding that could otherwise be used to support frequent and reliable fixed route service. So the lack of paratransit funding has trickled down effects on service quality across the system. Next slide. The situation is similar with the region's free and reduced fare programs. The state appropriation covers less than 20% of the cost of free and reduced rides for seniors and for people with disabilities. This year's budget for the program is just over $88 million, but pre-COVID this number was $110 million, and we expect it will get back there and continue to grow. This program is also federally mandated and linked to the federal formula funds the RTA receives to fund the system's capital program. So if we are not offering these programs to residents, then we don't have access to the federal capital funding, which is used um, to maintain and expand the system. For decades, this funding has always been far below uh, its actual cost of the program. Next slide. We're sharing all this, this background to demonstrate the reality that insufficient funding for existing programs is, is holding the entire system back. And that's why um, it's feeding our thinking to, behind our legislative strategy for how to approach any expansion conversations. We need to stress to legislators that increasing transit operations funding will allow us to re rely less on rider fares and instead focus on equity and impact. So this is uh, a strategy both to secure additional funding to support the entire system and make the system more equitable um, because we would be in a position to rely less on rider fares. It's why we're advocating for legislators to begin to address the budget gap by fully funding existing programs for vulnerable riders, along with any discussion of expansion. We don't wanna dig a deeper hole by adding a new program like Free Fares for Youth, for example, without fully funding paratransit and current free and reduced ride programs. These programs are pop popular with legislators and RTA and the service boards are in regular conversations with leaders about them. There have been several bills introduced in recent years, as, as some of you may have seen, that would establish free fares for youth or free fares for students. But without additional funding, any expansion would put us in a deeper financial hole. If, however, expansion was part of a larger funding package that included fully funding the existing programs, it could help reduce our funding gap and help make our system more equitable. Next slide. Here are a few different ways we could expand the program as part of a larger funding package. All these approaches already exist in other regions and several have been proposed in some form for the Chicago area, even just in today's discussion, where I heard a few references to these concepts. So first there's an income-based program where all people experiencing low incomes can access free or reduced rides. This income verification process could be linked to a broadly understood benefit program like SNAP. So just for example, all residents of SNAP eligible households could get access to 50% discounted rides. Another option is to provide free or reduced rides on select routes in parts of the region where people experiencing low incomes live and work. So here, one or multiple bus routes or train lines would be discounted or fare free to all riders. 
the Fair Transit South Cook pilot, as, as referenced in today's discussion, is a good example of this approach in our region. Cook County is funding a program for 50% discounted rides on Metro Electric and Rock Island across Chicago's South Side and South Suburbs. Another approach could be providing free rides to select groups of residents like students or youth. Many of the largest bus systems in the US are already free for youth who are just asked to show a student ID or student fare card after boarding. Final option is a universal or modal program where we sought funding to make all transit trips fare free or all bus trips fare free. Next slide. Clearly there are trade-offs with each of these approaches and, and here's where we want your input. Which of these approaches is most appealing or most compelling to you? Where is the need most urgent? Some factors to consider as you're thinking through this evaluation, who are the people who are benefiting the, benefiting, benefiting the most? How easy or how hard would it be to implement and manage? And how much might it cost? How might it impact ridership and operations? To be clear, RTA is not the decision maker here. The legislature will ultimately decide what a funding package looks like. But we're working to help build regional consensus around a preferred approach so we can carry that message to the legislature in future sessions. So these are the questions we're asking internally and we're doing analysis and having conversations. Um, and here we want to open up that conversation um, and get your input um, and thoughts and questions um, as the project moves forward. And I think Melissa is going to facilitate um, kicking off some of that input. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Uh, I think that was really helpful to kind of lay the groundwork and we'll have more discussion as well. I'm going to put a quick poll on the screen for people to answer about which of these expansion options do you think would most equitably serve the region? Um, of the things that, that Kyle was just talking about, an income-based program, again, this may be tied to something like SNAP, a geography-based program that is tied to where people live, free for select riders, or a more universal program. So we'll give people a chance to answer that and think about what you think would most equitably serve the region. Uh, which is just kind of one of the factors to that we have to consider as we think about a program like this. We'll give maybe just a little bit longer for people to answer the question. And then we can talk about what people think for a minute or so. And also feel free to share any thoughts that you have in the chat. We'll make sure to save the chat as well and, and keep all those thoughts recorded. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll in just a second. And I'll share back the, the results. Hopefully you guys are seeing those, uh, but it looks like the most common answer was an income-based program is what people felt would be most equitably, that would most equitably serve the region. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to come off mute and kind of share why they voted for that or share in the chat, um, why you feel that may be more equitable than something that's geography based or something, but um, we'd love to hear thoughts. I know there's a couple hands up maybe from earlier, so I'm not sure if. Uh... Let's go to uh, Fabio. I know Fabio has been waiting. <clears throat> uh, sure, hi, thanks for me. Fabio from Commuters Take Action. Uh, and yeah, um, one of the options in the poll was about uh, and doing it based on a mode and it kind of goes along with uh, my earlier comment that I was going to have is if you make I mean I don't know buses free and trains till you get a pay then you cannot create kind of a tiered system and you know one can argue that trains are higher quality transportation than buses so then we the folks that aren't able to pay for them we stick them on the worse worse uh mode of transit which I you know is not really great you know you know then you, you can just pay to pay up to have a better transit, which I don't think is uh, very equitable. I think um, goes along with a comment I was going to have earlier. Uh, I think a big, uh, big opportunity for uh, improving kind of fair, fair equity in Chicago is uh, having full integrated fare. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of areas of Chicago are served by potentially quality transit that's provided by Metra, but Metra fares are so much higher than CTA fares, which I think is a big barrier to entry. So, uh, you know, if I am a transit pass holder for the CTA and I want to go somewhere in within the city of Chicago, 
I should be able to get on a metro train for the same fare. I think this would uh, really enable quality transit access for a lot of uh, underserved areas. Great, appreciate the comment. Um, and uh, I, I, I like how you framed that around um, ensuring that this doesn't come at a cost to service or creating a tiered system. Um, and then obviously the, the connection to uh, creating a seamless experience for riders as well. Um, L.E. Brown, if you want to come off mute, and then we'll go to Kevin Brubricker after that. Hey, um, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I am also coming from outside eyes looking in while my family has been here, born and raised, and I grew up here, um, pseudo. Um, I've lived in other places like Texas and um, Dallas specifically and Philadelphia. Um, where I've experienced their public transportation system, um, even for communities that are systemically disenfranchised, such as those we could say communities of color, specifically my community is a black community. Um, so I currently live over on the South Shore. So I think that obviously we know the further we get South, that's why we're having conversations like this to improve um, the transportation and actually one conversation before I started speaking that I was having in the chat is, you know, um, when I said I chose location at first I was going to choose income base because naturally I'm thinking the wealth gap. But if we look at the geographical gap that's due to not just redlining, um, but a whole bunch of other industrial uh, issues and why certain uh, demographics are placed in certain areas in the city of Chicago. Uh, we could look at that specifically and address that by giving those people the freest access to get out of those communities to experience and have accessibility to other areas of Chicago or other areas um, throughout Illinois. Um, and for most people, once you get a taste of the travel and freedom that you can have outside of your neighborhood, it's like a bug and you continue to explore that. So I think that um, there is a huge opportunity here to think outside of the box and think outside of the gaps that have traditionally had us having these repeat conversations. But I appreciate uh, you all holding this space. Thank you for that comment. You're, you're unpacking a lot there, but definitely getting um, kind of to these trade-off elements. Um, income is very tied uh, to geography in our region. We, we live in a very segregated region, um, uh, as well as some of these uh, kind of rider elements about simplicity of how the program works. If you just have this access to it, it opens up a whole world of opportunity to the rider. Um, great comments. Kevin, I'm going to go to you next. Go ahead. Um, to state the obvious, there, there's no free lunch here. Anytime we're talking about reducing fares, we need to raise that money from somewhere else. That's not, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have these conversations and shouldn't be providing for equitable services, but I think we need to, it's hard to have that conversation in a vacuum. I mean, if we are, for example, going to pay for, pay for reduced fares by increasing the sales tax, in some ways, that's even less equitable. Um, you know, the, the, there, there are other factors in here. Where, where is the money coming from in a more equitable, equitable way than, for, than from the fairs? I think needs to be part of the conversation. Appreciate the point, Kevin. Um, I think the, the, the strategy on our end is in line with your comment of saying, you know, sales tax and fares are the two big sources that fund our system. And we think that we should have a dedicated source of revenue that covers these critical services um, that uh, we think the state should take a, a lead role uh, in, in providing that funding. Um, it would so, be a, a significant reform to the way the system works currently. So does that mean the state gets the money from the sales tax or the income tax or what? Those are the those are the kinds of details we're working through. Um, but the the strategy here is that we are securing sustainable funding to uh, fully fund the, these critical services and then allow us the opportunity to expand um, to offer it to more people. Um, we will go to uh, Michael uh, and then we'll do Arnold after that. Michael, go ahead. Hey, this is Michael from BSC. Um, so I just want to raise a big concern that I have with the number of, with the percentage of people who voted for an income-based program. Um, I voted for universal um, or modal. 
I think when we talk about reduced and free fares, we have to really consider that part of the equity aspect of it is making sure that it is easy to access. Um, it is uh, easy to access both. We, we need to make sure that these things are easy to access. And I think for anybody who I, there are many of us on this call who have qualified for many of these fair benefits, but there are many of us on this, on this call who have never had to do an application like that. And I think we're forgetting that every time we put up a barrier and every time we put up a means test, that is a time tax on people. And so that is going to make it more difficult and it's going to make it harder for people to get access to these benefits. I work in a subsidized housing administration right now, and I can tell you that people do not access benefits that exist for them because it is difficult to access them. There are barriers that are constantly put up. You're constantly needing to prove and provide extra evidence about your qualifications for this program. And yet we know from other countries and we know from other urban regions that we can make much more simple programs that are universally accessible that still achieve many of the goals that we're trying to lay out here. Vienna, Austria uses a program called the Jahreskarte. It means the year card. It is a 365 euro um, unlimited transit pass for an entire year. So you're paying a euro a day. There are still reduced options for students, senior citizens, people with disabilities, people who are low income. That program was so popular that when I left Vienna in 2016, there are more, the number of people who had a Jahreskarte actually exceeded the number of people who had a car in Vienna by that time, because it's simple, it's easy, it's relatively affordable for everybody. So you also then just expand access on that front. And they still had these, um, these backstops to make sure that the people who absolutely needed reduce, further reduced fares were able to access them. So I, I think we need, if we're gonna be talking about equity, we need to be talking about how people access these things. And we need to be talking about things like time taxes. And we need to be talking about things how, like, how if you put up a barrier, people won't access this stuff. SNAP, having SNAP is not a good enough measure because a lot of people who probably should be on SNAP don't actually qualify for SNAP because once again, we put up barriers constantly to keep people from actually accessing these benefits by mean testing them. So let's be realistic <laughs> what we're thinking about when we're talking about equity in these things. Yeah. And, and honestly, the best way to achieve these things and the best way to make them universal is to make them accessible to everybody, because right. then everybody starts to have a interest in these programs working and they all start to benefit from it. So we really need to be thinking about these things. And I think anybody who said income based and not universal should consider what that actually means in practice, because in practice, I can say when you do it income based, it sucks for the people who are trying to access it. And I can see it all the time in the work that I'm already doing. Appreciate Michael, that thanks point. for the, jumping in on I'm going to jump in Michael right there. Michael, is the uh, pass paid in advance for a Sorry, you I'm going to jump in You can pay it in advance quick. or as you go. So, oh. so, so, so you can pay it like in advance an or as you go. So there's fair capping as well. We're going to um, we're gonna cut the conversation here. Um, just for Melissa, a second, because, yeah. I know there may be some people who need to jump off at 1030. We built in an extra half hour for conversation because I think we knew everyone would have a lot to say, but we also want to be respectful of people's time who need to go to other meetings today. So Peter, if you want to jump ahead just two slides so we can let people know how they can stay engaged with us. Um, and then we will come back to this conversation. Like I said, RTA, we're all staying on here for another half hour to keep this going. But if you do need to jump off, I just want to say again, thank you so much for joining. We know there's a lot to think about in all of these topics, and we want to keep having these conversations. Um, please make sure that you fill out the membership survey for the coalition if you have not already. That'll let us know how you want to be engaged and how we can improve, um, you know, what topics you want to talk about. Um, there's also a feedback survey we're going to share in the chat, and we'll send by email as a follow-up to let us know what you thought of this meeting, how we can do better in the future. Um, it's clear so many people here really care about transit and want to stay engaged. So please make sure that you're signed up for our newsletters and following us on social media. We will be having more coalition meetings. There'll be another one later this summer um, and we will keep everyone updated on all of these topics. Um, and like I said, if you need to jump off at 1030, uh, we've just put all the links in the chat that you need for the blog, the plan, the feedback survey, everything that you need. If you want to reach out to us by email, um, thank you so much for coming. If you need to leave, we understand. But if you would like to stay and continue this conversation, 
um, we are going to stay here until 11 and we can having that uh, this conversation and keep going. I just wanted to get that in there for people who had to leave, but um, we can go back a couple slides and, and keep calling on people and keep having discussion if that's what we want to do. Um, or we can just take the slides down and, and chat. Um, I think uh, either way is fine. Yeah, I, uh, I just want to echo Melissa's sentiments. Um, really, really appreciate uh, the passion that people bring to this conversation. Um, we It's clear we have an informed uh, body of stakeholders that have expertise uh, uh, to offer to the discussion. Um, I do also just want to stress, though, there's a lot of people here. We want to hear from others. Um, we want to be inclusive. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Um, but I, I think there are a couple people that have had their hands up for a while um, that I'd like to hear from. Uh, our thought here is let's let's uh, try and contain some of this discussion around the specific program and then also leave it, uh, a little bit of time and space for any just kind of general questions that people may have about anything that we talked about today. Um, so on on the on the topic, though, I want to go to Arnold next and then we'll go to Serena and then we'll go to Lori after that. So, Arnold, if you'd like to come off mute, provide your comment. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Arnold Bradford. I am a, an active senior server, also executive director of Crossroads Collaborative. I live in the south uh, east side of Chicago, actually in South Chicago, and I write uh, all of the services uh, throughout the region. Uh, but I have a personal concern. I have children scattered in all of the suburbs. And so I have to use uh, a lot of different ways to get to them. Uh, in particular, I take the Metro Electric uh, to a bus downtown, take a bus to BNSF, you know the routine. It takes three to five hours. And uh, just imagine having to pay fares twice on Metro. Uh, so, you know, when we start talking about fare structures, we have to be aware of the fact that we have some seniors here that have limited income. And when you say seniors, some of us, by virtue of the fact that we're seniors, we're not as mobile. And so it's even more difficult for us. So accessibility is key. Also attractiveness, I'll give you a specific. Uh, at our station in Millennium Station, the elevator doesn't work and hasn't worked consistently for years. And you might wanna make a note of that. It is filthy. And if you're in a, I was on a cane, a crutch, I couldn't access it. I had to walk up those stairs, it was awful. So I just wanna make a few comments, but please let's, let's try to maintain some kind of support. The permits or reduce fares are essential to our community, otherwise, uh, you're uh, you're going to eliminate ridership. We won't go at all. We won't pay at all. <laughs> so thank you so much for that opportunity. Appreciate those comments. Uh, we'll go to Serena next. Go ahead, Serena. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Is my audio working okay? Yep. Great. Okay. Hi, I'm Serena Chapa, pronoun she, her. I work with professionals as a community engagement equity coordinator. Um, and I'm also an advocate, so I am coming from that perspective, to be fair. I don't really work on the finance side of things. Um, and so I guess I kind of going a little bit off of things that have been mentioned and something Michael talked about with some of the options is, um, I mean, I've been a transit writer for years, and then our members are all over the city and in the surrounding communities. So that's something that we think about a lot is accessibility for our staff and for our members and things like income-based, geography-based um, and kind of every solution that has been given, you have those gaps of like, we have programs and services that are on the north side, but we have members that are on the south and west sides um, or in the suburbs. And so, or they work, you know, people work downtown, but live on the south side. And so doing it based on those types of metrics, you're always going to lose people in gaps. And those might be the people that need it the most. Um, and I get like, I've lost my wallet before and been like, I need to get on the train. You know, um, you're worried about being criminalized for jumping um, and don't want to, you know, run into that issue as well. So I think something that in an advocacy space we do is targeted universalism is, you know, catching everyone. And so thinking about a solution that is built for everybody and thinking outside of the solutions we've had kind of in the United States where transit isn't as used or like as robust as it is in other places. Um, and so my question, I guess, for the RTA is what does it look like to bring up other solutions in this space that we aren't talking about yet um, because I think a lot of the ones that we have are still 
um, bringing major gaps for a lot of our communities that we really want to support. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. Um, I think uh, a, a lot of, uh, uh, or I guess one thing I would add to a lot of the comments around barriers for the rider and the challenge of uh, accessing a benefit program sometimes um, is also it's harder to implement on the agency side. And that is not something we're interested in producing for the RTA or the service boards is a, a complicated system. Um, so the, definitely the spirit of something more universal that is easy for riders, easy to implement um, is certainly kind of in, on the target here. Uh, I want to go to Lori and then we'll go to Kwame uh, after Lori. Go ahead, Lori. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Lori Newsom, the Chief Financial Officer for Payne. And one of the things that I would like for us to think about um, is the fact that the state of Illinois and as well as the city of Chicago and many municipalities throughout the state have done a very good job in trying to create affordable housing opportunities in some of the more affluent communities and affluent um, uh, towns in Illinois. So when we think about, you know, maybe trying to establish uh, the uh, fair free, the fair free program by ge geography, we might want to re we might want to give some thought to the fact that in those communities that are more affluent, where they have created affordable housing opportunities for low income families, we might be missing an opportunity to, to support those families if we're based upon geography. So um, I think that you know we really should think about you know how to do it based upon income to capture low-income people in those affluent communities. But by the same token, I agree with the gentleman who talked about, you know, making sure that we eliminate barriers so that it will be easier for people to access those programs. But I don't want us to miss the opportunity to go into affluent communities and help those low-income families. Appreciate that perspective. Um, definitely, uh, definitely need to tie this to other work that we're doing around TOD, around development. I'm sure it's kind of a seamless approach um, from that sense as well. Uh, Kwame, uh, you go ahead and come off mute and provide your comment or question. Uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll be very brief. But yeah, the comment I wanted to make was basically more of just a follow up on the Metro Electric Fair Transit Program, because I think that um, as you guys try to make a or expand, reduce fare or free transit program that could be also a very good model, mainly because not only its success of bringing back pre-pandemic ridership, um, even just some of the basic infrastructure around it where, you know, you can get off a stop in Homewood, Harvey, to some extent even University Park, and you can like walk to different locations or go to different locations, um, which is one of the biggest barrier. And think another additional comment I would like to make is that with fair collection too, that is also a trade-off because just having to do fair collection costs money, whether it's uh, employees on the Metra trying to collect fares or collect cash or trying to install gates at a CTA station. So this could be an opportunity maybe to do some cost saving in that end too. So that was just the quick comment I would like to make. Oh, one last thing I forgot. Um, and I know that at least in the last Metro meeting, it was, it was mentioned that they wanted to expand that uh, fair, South Cook Fair Transit Program. So if RTA would be able to support that, I think that would also be a great opportunity, um, especially since you're looking into doing more programs like it. Thank you for those comments. Uh, definitely uh, picked up on some of the operational elements of this. I think it's important to consider. Um, I am seeing uh, a lot of activity in the chat. Um, Melissa, anything that you would like to raise? Um, sure. Awesome conversation and back and forth happening there. We are capturing this. Uh, but if there's any questions or anything you wanted to bring to the broader group from the chat. Sure, yeah, there's been a lot of good conversation kind of responding to what people have been saying in the meeting. Um, and I will say there's people from the service boards here and from CMAP here that are also responding as well. So we appreciate that. Um, a lot of people talking about fair integration in the chat and how that can make a difference. And uh, those are kind of ongoing conversations as well. Uh, something else that we were going to 
to talk about in the main meeting was, you know, we've talked a lot about the most equitable option and there was like some back and forth on that, but we were also going to ask people to think about those other trade-offs and those other factors, the maybe what's the most equitable program, is it necessarily the easiest to implement to get, you know, legislators on board with, is it necessarily the most urgent, is it necessarily you know, the one that's going to capture those gaps that Serena was talking about. So um, really appreciate all the, the conversation that we've had. Um, and if people have other thoughts they want to share, we are still here to listen. Um, some comments in the chat still about fair integration being a priority um, and that there also, you know, could be a cost to doing fair integration, um, which are things that, you know, there are kind of pluses and minuses to everything in this in this world that we are, have to navigate. So we appreciate the conversation with everyone. Yeah, I uh, I see a couple of hands up. We'll go to those hands in a moment. I wanna see one uh, idea, see if we get a comment on it though. Um, a major element of this topic in uh, um, politics uh, recently has been around student fairs. Um, we haven't heard much about student fairs, so I'll see the discussion if anyone has any input to provide um, specifically on, on uh, in the city of Chicago, um, you know, expanding student fairs for CPS students. Um, but to hands up, I see Ryan, I'm not sure if that's a new hand or up from earlier. Did you have another comment to add? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it was true. Um, I just wanted to mention, I was just going to put in the chat because I know there's so many people. I thought they might not call me again, but um, I think the elephant in the room, and no one wants to address it because it's a big statewide issue, but the cost um, of having all these boards, these different boards, RTA, CTA, PACE, Metra, so it's four different boards and four different organizations, and the extreme rivalry that goes on, and we're not even talking about with the, the rivalries and the fights between the, the four boards and the legislature and the city of Chicago and the suburbs, et cetera, et cetera. But the cost is is just absolutely astronomical. And um, for instance, people for years have been, you know, they, we pick on all these issues around it, but really at the heart of it, that's that's a big obstacle to the implementation of almost everything that everyone's saying. People say, oh, why can't Metro integrate with Paris? Why can't there's no incentive to Metro will not. We have with the Harvey Historical Society, we have a petition with them right now, just fighting to get them to listen to us since January to talk about plans for our new downtown station. They don't even want to listen. So I think um, you know, imagine, imagine that. I mean a lot of things, these things just won't happen as long as we don't have the incentive of like people uh, in these in these different public agencies having to work together. I don't know what the answer is. I'm not, I don't know if it's to be like an MBTA, like in Boston or New York. I think they just have one agency. Um, whatever it is though, I think we need to figure that out because otherwise we're going to have a lot more of these meetings guys and people are just going to keep raising cute little points of, well, we want to do this, 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 but ultimately because of the high budgets and the people at each other's throats with these different boards, um, a lot of these things won't happen because, um, because one agency will feel threatened by, um, you know, cooperating to do that particular thing that we want done and, and, you know, so they won't do it. So, I mean, it's, I'm like, I'm sorry to say that, and I know it might be difficult, but that has to be faced. Appreciate the comment. <clears throat> I think our official position is that the biggest priority right now is securing sustainable funding for, for our system. Um, governance is a, something to maybe tackle as a part of that. Uh, it's something that um, is always a challenge. Uh, Illinois politics uh, are, are challenged in this way. Um, but again, the sustainable funding is the, is the focus right now. Um, Adam, I see your hand is still up. Is that an old hand? Did you have another comment to offer? Oh, um, I, I added something in the chat. Um, um, I, I was the one who uh, made, a, made, made a comment about, uh, about fair integration. Um, the South Suburban and South Side funding that produce fares on Rock Island and Metro Electric should have included bus transfers, and that certainly would have improved um, that would have improved access. Um, I really liked uh, what Michael was talking about earlier um, with regard to getting people onto transit simply because we make uh, the passes so easy to get. And um, I think um, I think that would be the winning thing to pursue uh, 
break down the barriers because we make these programs easy and uh um uh, you know find find a way for find a way for people to get passes because we're selling discount passes uh through employers or we're selling discount passes through social agencies or something just make it real easy to get people just make it real easy uh, to get people the passes without going through myriad hoops on on income qualification that's addressing people like consumers and that should uh that should that should uh, serve demand thank you appreciate that perspective um kate low i saw you had a hand up did you have a comment forth. Um, I wanted to say that I really appreciate this conversation and I think we're really, you know, trying to shift the whole way we think about funding transit and um, fares are part of how we've been so reliant. So I think it's bringing up a lot of ideas and it's exciting. One thing I can't, one thing that's been really helpful is folks who have experience either as a writer or a direct interface with those who are experiencing cost burdens. So I think that's been a really valuable contribution. So I um, hope that going forward, we can continue to get that those perspectives and perhaps even more, um, because I think that has been um, a, a really important kind of reality check in terms of, I, I saw Kyle put in the chat that New York City has actually had enrollment problems to get a benefit. So um, raising those complexities and administrative burdens. But one thing I just in, in the spirit of like trying to make sure we're hearing from those most affected, um, I think there's been some great points raised. I, I don't know if it's me, but I'm I kept on being like, maybe I shouldn't talk, maybe I should talk. But my perception has been there's been a really big gender disparity in who's taken up verbal space. And I think that's just something to think about um, and hard to handle. I have it in my classes, but um, that's something for us to think about going forward is, um, and, and, and I, I think there's also been some racial disparities in what voices we're hearing from. So that's just something for us to think about in um, this coalition. I truly appreciate that comment, Kate. Um, it was a note that I had written down uh, about 20 minutes into this was, uh, we're hearing from one type of voice predominantly. Um, please, if others have opinion on this topic, raise a hand and speak, um, add that to the survey. This is, uh, this is an active living experience that we are trying um, to change and to, to make sure that people have an opportunity to provide their input to. Um, so I, I welcome that feedback, Kate, and I hope um, others provide other feedback um, either here in the meeting or in the survey as to how we might improve that experience. Um, <clears throat> a lot, a lot there uh, in some of your other comments. Um, something to respond to, uh, you, you know, in, in the in the plan, in the um, agenda for advocacy and action, we talk about moving away um, from a system that is so reliant on fares and towards a system that is uh, focused on, on equitably providing access to the region. And it's really hard to like understand what that means. I don't, I, I think I wrote that part of it and I don't totally understand what that means, <laughs> um, but I think it's easy to explain the products of that. And that's, I think that's kind of what you're getting at Kate of, um, you know, if we have a sustainable funding source uh, for these critical programs for the ADA paratransit for free and reduced fares, um, that means that we can offer more of it. We can expand access because we are not so reliant on fare revenue. Um, I think that applies to some of the advances we've seen um, in fare integration that have happened during the pandemic. Um, there is actually a monthly regional pass that you can use across the entire system. Uh, I think that is fundamentally a product of the service boards having um, currently COVID relief funds that allow them to integrate um, their fare passes more completely. Um, same, same with uh, PACE and CTA um, coordinating more on, and in, integrating more. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the product. That, that's what it means to move away from a system that's so reliant on fares. Um, so all, all part of the discussion, all what we're trying to expand um, here uh, Lori, I see you still have a hand up. Is there another comment or is that from earlier? I'm sorry, that's from earlier. No problem at all. Um, that's all the hands. Uh, I think we've we've called on everybody that had a comment relative to the discussion. 
just want to remind if there are general questions people have about this that we're we're here for another at least 11 minutes and we'd be we'd be happy to talk more and I would say also the, the feedback survey that um, has been shared in the chat a few times and we'll share it by email has an opportunity to let us know how we could do these meetings better if the, the time or you know format doesn't work for people or anything like that. And also another opportunity to share your thoughts on this specific topic. So we'll make sure to um, take that into consideration before we do the next one of these. Brian, I see you have a hand up. If that's a new comment, go ahead and. No, yeah, thanks. Just wanted to thank you guys uh, again, the RTA, for having this meeting. I, I also I mentioned, I think, to Tina or something at the, the last function you had in person, how much um, I, I how how different and more welcomed I felt with the RTA versus when I went for the Harvey Historical Society to give comments during public feedback at the Metro Board meeting that I, I just felt like I was sort of um, looked at with suspicion and disdain and it, it was just very uncomfortable as as a member of a public going in there and with lots of suits and it felt real stuffy and intimidating um but i do feel differently at rta um i guess my question is how can we incorporate um more of that openness into into all the the boards again so that they're you know they're talking to each other and they're all taking um the public uh feedback and input um, and what is RTA's role in that? Because technically it's over everyone, but it seems like so far from what I've heard, it's sort of like, no, we don't really like to get involved. But then at the end of the day, it's like, well, all right. So if, you know, if things aren't going, if the boards aren't cooperating, let's say, like for instance, with the red line, and I don't know if you, you guys remember how Mayor Lightfoot and Cook County and Metra and the CTA and everyone was fighting, right? They couldn't because, um, they couldn't figure out how to how, how to sort of to get along, you know, uh, to make that work. And so I just thought, hmm, could the RTA uh, play a role in that? I mean, I, I would think that would be logical, but it, it doesn't seem to have maybe done so in the past, at least not that I'm aware. But, you know, to really say, hey, come on, Metro CTA Pace, get your act together. You know, like, let's all work together here. And if you're not, we're going to step in and have some sort of oversight. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I, you know, I think to, to try to answer broadly your question, the primary role of the RTA um, in this kind of format is to convene, to bring stakeholders together um, regionally to, to kind of try and get up above, um, you know, some of the, the city, suburbs, uh, county um, politics that, that, you know, generally speaking, govern a lot of what we do. Um, but all the service boards are in the room today. They, they hear these comments. Um, we, we're, we're trying to our best to create, um, you know, a welcome and inviting experience for people that are participating in this process. Um, and we, we use that same approach when we're coordinating with the service boards as well. Um, so that's really not the, the focus of today's discussion. We hear you on, on some of those things, um, but I do want to leave space for others that, that have comments that pertain more directly to this. Um, Isaac, if you want to come off mute and uh, provide your comment. Sure. So kind of offering some anecdotal experience from uh, where I'm from currently right now in Champaign-Urbana, um, particularly like with regards to student fairs. So the model that um, CUMTD has is Illinois students as a part of their fees and tuition, like pay like a mandatory fare, which makes it so that like all um, bus trips are free. And I don't think like student ridership would be nearly as high as it is um, without this program. And I think particularly like when thinking about student populations, I guess making um, transit travel as like easy as possible when compared to like available alternatives like ride sharing and stuff like that um, is really a great way to engage, I guess, my demographic. Appreciate that input. Um, I think, again, ease of use, uh, very important. And, um, you know, I think connecting uh, with youth, with students was a challenge during plan development, um, but it seems like an area that maybe we need to kind of go back to the drawing board on and get more direct input um, from writers that are that are students that are youth. Melissa, anything else from the chat? I know we're kind of getting close to the end of the format here. Any other comments? Um, particularly anything kind of just general comments about this this coalition, this process, or the other projects. 
Um, there was some conversation about, you know, the time of day of holding this meeting and, you know, there might be people who, you know, aren't able to join, a, you know, midday meeting like this. And that's definitely something we think about with engagement as well. Um, and just some ongoing conversation about kind of the format and voices that we're hearing from. So those are all things that we'll continue to take into consideration in the different ways that we hear from people. Um, we know those are, are barriers for people and we wanna make sure we're reaching different audiences. And um, yeah, there's some comments about uh, the Metra UPASS program in the chat or the CTA UPASS program, I'm sorry. Kwame, I see the hand up. Did you have another comment to make? Uh, yes, very briefly. I just wanted to make another comment on the Metro Electric program, uh, the Fair Transit program, particularly um, more long term, I suppose, is I think a possible expansion of that to the Pace Pulse, particularly Pace is planning to do like a bus rapid transit for 95th Street and Halstead. And I know that's years off, but especially if the RTA could get involved with that, I think that would be a great opportunity. But more specific to this meeting, one issue I ha have had in the program is despite successes, there still seems to be a lot of confusion within the people, sorry, within Metra itself. So I've been in multiple situations where I've had the past on another route, let's say like a Union Pacific route. Um, and even employees of Metro, they weren't sure if that would qualify. Technically, I don't think it would, but when I would ask around like, okay, can I use the reduced Metro electric pass on Union Pacific or Milwaukee or just the other routes, every time I asked a different Metro employee, I was told, basically a different answer. And I understand that's more Metro's issue, but I think going forward when creating these programs, I think there needs to be definitely more clarity about like, not only who can use it and how you can participate, but where uh, you could basically use these fares or use these passes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yep. Very appreciate the perspective. I think a major takeaway here is, um, you know, maybe this is a, a role for RTA to work on, help us communicating what what the uh, existing programs are, because um, it can be challenging for riders to understand um, kind of what's available to them. Uh, I think we are going to end the discussion for the day. Um, I want to thank everyone so much. Uh, we went uh, the full 30 minutes over, and there's still 70 participants uh, on the coalition meeting. I think that speaks to the passion that people are bringing to this. Um, we're excited uh, for the work ahead. We need you, uh, we need your expertise, uh, we need your voices. Um, so we're gonna take all of the, the input that we received here, uh, both kind of to the overall coalition, the format of these meetings and try to improve things as we go. Um, I wanna plug again, the, the survey opportunities. So the membership survey, where you can tell us a little bit about yourself, about how you'd like to be involved, if there's any specific topics that you bring expertise to. Um, as well as the feedback survey uh, that's kind of just on um, on the meeting format in general and how we did. Uh, and then just again, um, if you want to continue the discussion or provide more comments um, about any of this, you can do so by email, communications at rtachicago.org uh, is the place to start. Uh, that will connect you with the appropriate staff member. Um, and then uh, we will see you all again uh, for the next quarterly uh, Transit is the Answer Coalition meeting. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Surprise.